it is written in a way that you can obviously see that those stories have something in common. But one story happens on this side of this chiastic structure when we deal with Abram and Sarai. The other story is on the other side where we have Abraham and Sarah H. Right? And what is interesting is that in both situations we have uh, Sarah taken by a king. Pharaoh, a king of Egypt on one side, and on the other side, another king called, what? Abimelech. Let's look at the two stories. Sarai and the Pharaoh. That story is in chapter 12, starting with verse 8. On your worksheet, you can see a little chiastic arrangement. In the middle section, section C, you have that expression, and it came to pass, or so it was. That's uh, the NKJ. But in the Hebrew, it's the same exact expression. And it came to pass, so it came to pass. That's the central part. The previous section, section B, on one side, Abram goes down to Egypt. On the other side, Abram comes up from Egypt. So you have this movement. I told you before that in a chiastic structure, you often have a movement. One way and then the other way. Okay? And then section A, the beginning and the end of uh, the story in chapter 12, you have Bethel or Beit El, the house of God, on both sides. You have the altar on both sides. And you also have the expression called on the name of the Lord. So that is just to see how beautifully the story is being told. The structure is pretty clear here. Now, Abraham goes down to Egypt because of famine. When you are hungry, you go where there is food. Even if initially he probably didn't have that in his uh, journey plans that he would end up in Egypt. He was sent by God into Canaan. But interestingly, God discloses where he sends Abraham piece by piece. Abraham doesn't have, or Abram at that time, doesn't have a full picture from the very beginning. So he goes down to Egypt, and it came to pass, verse 11, when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Guess what? Abraham knew his wife was beautiful. That's something. That's remarkable, and I'm emphasizing that because after a certain age, after some time, we men tend to forget some stuff. So Abraham, he's not young, very young. He's 75 at that time, and he still knows his wife who's younger. How much younger? Like 10 years younger. But she's still beautiful at, what, 65. Uh, you're happy, right? <laughs> Good. So <laughs> he realizes as he's going down to Egypt, close to entering Egypt, he's not even there, but he, he already knows. Therefore, it will happen 
when the Egyptians see you, that they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. What kind of guy is this? Pretty selfish. It looks like that. Uh, yeah, uh, fearful. All is the survival instinct. Let's do whatever it takes that we will survive. I don't want to judge him too harsh because he also deals with famine. When you're hungry and uh, you feel threatened, there are some things happening in you. So it came to pass again, when Abraham came into Egypt, so now he's there, that the Egyptians saw the woman that she was very beautiful. The princess of Pharaoh also saw her and commanded her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake. Lucky guy. How come they could take her and this guy didn't say anything? How do I know he didn't say anything? Let's read on. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? So he didn't disclose the truth. Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Some translations have it so that I took her for my wife. So it's a translation matter. You can translate it both ways. One translation, the one that says, I might have taken her as my wife, is conditional. It suggests he took her to the palace, but she never became his wife. The other translation suggests she was taken to the palace and the Pharaoh had her as his wife. Now, we can debate that part. Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. And, of course, Abraham went up from Egypt. What we don't know in this story yet is that what Abraham told Pharaoh was halfway true. How do we know that? Well, see how the parallel structure can help? There is data that is not disclosed here, but is disclosed over here. Jump to the next story. And there, in chapter 20, you can find that indeed he was half-brother of uh, his wife. Okay? So, he did not lie technically, but the way he treated the whole situation was obviously deceitful. Same story is repeated with Abimelech. So then God came to Abimelech, that's chapter 20, verse 3. 
But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man. That's God speaking to Abimelech. Because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Now, imagine yourself in Abimelech's situation. But Abimelech had not come near her. Here, we know for sure from the text that Abimelech had no sexual relationship with Sarah. And he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hand, I have done this. And God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. For I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet. Now that, again, is quite challenging. So here you have a prophet that is so short-sighted that uh, he repeats the same mistake. Because after his first experience with Pharaoh, you would say, this guy will never do this again. Well, guess what? He did it again. Therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet. And he will pray for you and you will live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So in the end, in the story, Abraham is the one that prays for Abimelech that he will not be hit by anything. Now this is, again, very strange because I can imagine Abimelech was very upset. When Abraham fails, God speaks to a pagan king. And let me emphasize this for a reason. If anybody here has this impression that God depends on you and you are the hub of the universe, or Seventh-day Adventists are indispensable. No. God has his ways. And he never gives up on people like we would give up on people. This is probably a corrupt pagan king in some ways. But at the same time, he has some moral values. Strong moral values. And this king tells God, listen, are you going to slay a righteous nation also? Because his sense is his nation is in danger. And then he says, in the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. And God says, what? I know. And that's exactly why I came that's why I'm working with you. Because, yes, I value. I value your integrity. I value your innocence. And I really want to stop you from doing something crazy. Now, analyze your life a little bit from the time when you probably were far from God. Don't you remember stories, experiences in your life when God kind of spoke to you very directly, maybe even in a dream, and uh, told you, hey, stop, 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 stop. Don't do it. Stop. Right? Because God cares. God cares about Abraham, and God has a special relationship with Abraham in spite of his humanness. And yet, God cares about a pagan king as well, 
just the way he cared about Pharaoh in the previous story. Now, after Sarai and the Pharaoh, you have in brackets Genesis 15. That's not the place where the story is. The story of Sarai and the Pharaoh is in chapter 12. But I put in brackets chapter 15 there. Then God speaks to Abimelech. That is not happening in chapter 22. That happens in chapter 20. But I put in brackets Genesis chapter 22. Why? It's interesting how in the narrative, after these two experiences, God allows trial or brings trial in Abraham's life. After the first experience, when he deceitfully misled Pharaoh and his people, you have Genesis 15, in which God comes to Abraham and tells him, Abraham, take some animals, cut them in two, place them on one side and the other. And Abraham does that. And Abraham, in um, the context of those days and those habits and practices, he must have thought, all right, so now God is going to uh, show me what my destiny will be. I will have to pass through those animals, which actually meant that if I fail you again, just the way I failed you in Egypt, I will be cut in pieces. That's the meaning of that ritual. Because in those days, the subordinate king was uh, making a vow or a contract, a covenant, as the biblical concept, a relationship of vassality. And uh, the message was clear. If I fail you, if I'm not going to be faithful to you, I'll be cut in two pieces. So Abraham now does the ritual, cuts the animals, and waits for divine instruction. I will have to pass through those carcasses. And guess what? God comes to him and he passes through those carcasses, telling him, Abraham, yeah, I know what happened, but I want you to understand my character, my faithfulness to you. Because it is my faithfulness, and that's a beautiful teaching later on in the book of uh, Romans. It says that in the gospel, God's righteousness is revealed, verse 17, from faith to faith. Romans 1, 17, from faith to faith. But in biblical language, faith is the same as faithfulness. From faithfulness into faithfulness. So it's a demonstration of divine character. It's not Abraham or Abram, because the name change had not happened yet, that will be cut into pieces. God says, I'm going to be cut into pieces. And when you see the separation between the father and the son at the cross, that's actually happening. Second story, the one here, Sarah and Abimelech. After that episode, you have Genesis 22, when Abraham has to bring Isaac as a sacrifice on an altar on the mountain. And I can imagine Abraham thinking, Lord, you've given me a son, just like you promised. A son from me and my wife, Sarah. But I failed you again. So now you're going to hit me. And what can be more painful for somebody than losing your own son? Not only that, with your hands. And it's very weird because this Abraham comes from a society from uh, Mesopotamia where human sacrifices were just normal. And that's one of the signs of paganism 
in the remote past, and not only remote, even today there are places where they bring human sacrifices. So Abraham is there thinking, oh, so this God, Yahweh, seems to be pretty much the same kind of God that I'm used to because I'm coming from a context in which that happened in Mesopotamia and in Canaan as well. Now guess what? When he's almost there, doing it, the sound stops him and says, no, 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 not you. I'm not asking that from you. Let me show you what kind of God is this God, Yahweh. Look, in the thicket, you have the sacrifice. And what he said to his son, to Isaac, without knowing probably what he was saying, God will take care of the sacrifice. It was really happening. And who was symbolized or prefigured in that sacrifice? Jesus Christ himself. I don't need you to sacrifice your son for me. I'm going to sacrifice my son for you. Now that is the character of God. That's the one that Abraham served. And that's the one that you, being blessed in Abraham or because of Abraham, have the chance to serve. What kind of God is this? And I'm coming back to Genesis chapter 20, verse 4, where Abimelech has this conversation with God regarding righteousness. Will you slay a righteous nation also? In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. God says, yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. So God knows that. And God is interested in integrity, in innocence, in righteousness. Go back to chapter 18 and see again what God was speaking, talking about Abraham. Genesis 18, verse 19. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do what? Righteousness and justice. Why? Because God cares about righteousness and justice. And then look at verses 23 to 25, see how Abraham pleads with God when he intervenes for Lot. And Abraham came near and said, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? It's like the same kind of story that you see in the case of Abimelech. Here Abraham speaks, over there it's a pagan. See how beautiful it is? And in both cases, God cares. Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? He asks. Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you not also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Verse 25. Far be it from you to do such a thing as this to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Well, when I read what Abraham tells God, I can resonate with that because somehow God places in us this sense of right and wrong. This sense of just and unjust. And for God, that is important. Both in the case of believers, Abraham and his 
of springs, biological and spiritual. And in the case of the pagan that has a very limited knowledge of him. Now, I would like to close this section with Abraham's response and attitude in Genesis chapter 20 from 8 to 13. So Abimelech rose early in the morning, called all his servants and told all these things in their hearing and the men were very much afraid. And Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, what have you done to us? How have I offended you that you have brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You have done deeds to me that ought not to be done. The pagan explains to the faithful. Don't we feel like that sometimes? Then Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you have in view that you have done this thing? And Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place and they will kill me on account of my wife. But indeed, she is truly my sister and he explains how. He was her half-brother, brother from uh, the same mother. But have you noticed the reasoning of Abraham? I thought the fear of God is not in this place. That's verse 11. See how judgmental the faithful can become sometimes? And we have the impression everybody is from the devil. I'm the Lord's. And we have that mentality sometimes. We have the impression the church is God's and everybody else straight out from the devil. No, there was fear of the Lord there. Chapter 20, verses 17 and 18. So Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants. Then they bore children, because that was the divine intervention. They couldn't bear children. For the Lord had closed up all the wombs of uh, the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Thank God he had a way to bring reconciliation between Abraham and Abimelech. But this story if it doesn't stir you a little bit, then uh, I would ask, do you understand the concept of righteousness, of justice, how God operates? Your turn. Well, technically, he did not lie. <laughs> he just didn't say it. He deceived he misled people and yes he did it twice yeah, and you would have expected that uh, he would learn uh, that from that experience and would never repeat it again so the question is whether the famine abraham is experiencing is the same as joseph's well it cannot be the same why because abraham is what is he to joseph Okay, let's go backwards. Joseph's father is Jacob. Jacob's father is, okay. Isaac's father is, so what is Abraham to Joseph? Great grandfather. So historically, chronologically, the famine in the time of Joseph, when his brothers, biological brothers, come down to Egypt, Egypt is in picture again, and that has a significance down the road, but it's a different famine. It's much later historically. So the question is, plagues hit 
the Pharaoh and his house. How did he realize it was God's hand? Verse 17 in chapter 12. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? The text doesn't say. I could give you an answer. But the text doesn't say. Why am I saying it like this? We tend to have answers for everything. We know. I've learned something from the Bible. When the Bible doesn't say, I say, I don't know. Somehow, he knew. There is probably a way when God touches you that you will know. The question is, uh, in both cases, the Pharaoh's case and Abimelech's case, how is it that there was a certain kind of integrity with these pagan kings the observation is very pertinent. Abraham's lie, well, technically not lie, misleading or deceivery, half truth, created a context in which the pagan became righteous. Can you wrap your mind around that? When a righteous person, when a faithful person, a believer, when Abraham drops the ball, that righteous dropping the ball creates a context for the pagan of righteousness. And that's something that can blow your mind away. Speaking about God's character. Because that means God really takes in account what happens. He does not just judge uh, without looking at circumstances and, and taking in account, taking in balance, what led you to do what you've done? Because if they had known the truth, the full truth about Abram being Sarai's husband or Abraham being Sarah's husband, they would have not done it. At least in the case of Abimelech, we know it for sure. We don't know too much in the case of the Pharaoh. Very good question. So obviously, if that divine intervention that touched Abimelech and his house, because of which the women in his nation could not bear children, so it must have been quite a time. How long? Well, you don't need nine months to know that somebody couldn't conceive. But they somehow got to the realization, hey, something is happening with us, with our wives, that they don't get pregnant. How long was that? I have a very clear answer to that. I don't know. <laughs> so the question is regarding the concept of the covenant and how God deals with us. Well, with Abraham, but then through him or in him, because we become Abraham's offsprings spiritually, we are part of the same covenant. How does that work? Well, first of all, for the big frame, in biblical language, the covenant is not made. The covenant is cut. And the covenant is cut from that exact context in Genesis chapter 15, in which we can see a reflection of some practices of that time. For example, the Hittites were a nation that lived in Canaan, in parts of Canaan, and then they migrated north and uh, then settled in the area of Asia Minor, Anatolia, Today's Turkey. So those were the Hittites. There are documents that were found 
in which the full process of this covenant or covenantal uh, procedure is disclosed. So what happened? If a king overcame another king, the king of the Hittites overcame another king. You shouldn't uh, imagine kings in the sense or merely in the sense of somebody that reigns on a huge domain. Because you had those city kingdoms. Every city could have a king. So if the king of the Hittites overcame the king of this city, then that king, the victorious king, would uh, stand at the gate of the city, of the overcome city, and now that symbolizes he's, he's the boss there. He's the ruler. And the other king, the one that was overcome, he would be at the other end of this row or the two rows of uh, carcasses with the blood in between. And that king would walk down the aisle, so to speak, until he reaches that other king, the one that overcame him. And while he's walking down, he's saying, if I rebel against you, if I do not help you, if I fail you, let this happen to me. So when God turns the whole story around, he kind of tells Abraham, Abraham, if I let you down, let this happen to me. God is faithful. You have Bible verses that specifically say just that God is faithful. And when you sing the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, you can really mean it. There's a misleading concept in um, some evangelical uh, circles, especially those that uh, have... Uh, a dispensational view of the Bible, that there was a covenant in the Old Testament and then that covenant was canceled out and we have this new covenant in the sense that this is a replacement of the Old Covenant. Biblically, that's not true. Biblically, the covenant of Abraham continues. God has been faithful what happens with the new covenant that Jesus speaks about, the new covenant is a renewal of the covenant. Go, for instance, and read Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is a, a quote from uh, the book of Jeremiah, and it clearly says, I will make with the house of Israel a covenant. So it's not a different covenant, it's a renewal of the covenant. The covenant is made with the house of Israel. You and I become part of Israel. It's not a covenant with them and then God creates a new covenant with us, separate or independent of that. It is us being grafted into Israel. The picture of uh, the Bible in the language of um, the Apostle Paul is Romans chapter 9 and then 10 is when he says there was a wild olive tree and then there was a domestic olive tree. Some of the branches of the domestic olive tree were cut because of apostasy. And God took branches of the other olive tree, the savage, the wild olive tree, and grafted them into this olive tree. That's how you and I become part of Israel. And that's why 
in the end, Israel, this Israel will be saved. God's Israel. Israel, meaning either the, the fighter or the winner of God. Israel. So the question is, when Sarah was taken in one case and the other, did she become part of a harem? In the context of that civilization, most probably, yes. In the case of Pharaoh, it may be that the process was complete, although I don't have certainty. In the case of Abimelech, the process was probably started, but it was never brought to conclusion. In the Bible, there is a description of the Persian way of uh, somebody being added to the harem in the book of Esther. When Esther was taken as a wife, replacing Vasti, or Vashti, she was prepared first. There was a certain process, process of preparation. So when somebody was taken from somewhere, because it was very customary in those days if there was a strong king that they overcame or there was uh, a wealthy person in that realm, then the king would take somebody from that family, sometimes even the daughter of that king or that wealthy person. But there was a process as to how to add it to the harem. And I'm emphasizing this for a reason. Some people think those societies had no moral rules. And that's not true. They had a certain method to the madness. Was it moral from higher standards perspective? No. But in that context, people did know some principles of morality. So in that society, people were allowed up to a certain point in history to marry close relatives, even sisters. Obviously, Cain had to marry a sister or a niece. But later on, God uh, gives Moses some specifics about what is allowed and what is not allowed. Here we are still in between. So it seems that from God's perspective, Abraham marrying his half-sister was all right. There's nothing problematic with that. But the observation is very interesting. When that happens, when somebody marries his sister, or somebody is married to her brother, once the marriage happens, marriage takes primacy over the blood relationship. Because whenever God comes and speaks to those kings, he always emphasizes the fact that this woman is a wife. Not that God doesn't know she is a sister as well, but he emphasizes she is a wife. Yeah, interesting. Yes, so the observation is regarding the Old and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant being the law written on stones, and then the New Covenant being the law written in the heart and in the mind. Now, when God gave the stones, it is pretty obvious to me that his desire was not that the law will stay on stones. The reason God gave those tablets of stones was because he wanted his people to be able to read or the leadership of the people to be able to read and teach the people. So practically, it was an instrumental of divine pedagogy or teaching what does that mean when it comes to the new covenant? Does it mean that uh, now uh, God writes 
the law straight into somebody's heart? Has any of you just woken up one morning and felt something in the area of the heart and said, huh, one more law appeared? <laughs> so let's see it from a process standpoint. There at Sinai, you have a people who's probably illiterate. They are coming out from bondage, slaves. In slavery, with the exception of very few, which we also have in the American history of slavery, when very few people were allowed to get some sort of education, not because they uh, wanted to elevate them necessarily, but because they wanted to take the profit from that. Right? So, with very few exceptions, if any, those were illiterate people. So God gives them something very tangible. And Moses, he was the doctor, the PhD among them. You know, Moses had a doctorate. You didn't know? Yeah, he, <laughs> he, studied, he studied in the schools of Egypt, the highest schools of those days, because he was going to become a pharaoh. Okay? They didn't have the PhD title at that time, but from what he did, if a PhD is permanent head damage, he had some before he left Egypt. Okay? But, but the point is, Moses was not selected by God by haphazard. God was using one of the highest qualified scholar of the day. He knew how to read. And one of his responsibilities was to read. That's how it all started out. But later on, and even at that point, some parts of the law were not on the tablets. On the tablets, God gave the constitution, so to speak, the fundamental law. But there were other laws that were written down on uh, paper, so to speak. In those days, scrolls, right? Either papyrus or skins later. Okay, so you have later on the scriptures. So when God says, I'm going to write my laws into their hearts, into their mind, it's not directly as if God writes there with a pen. God uses this. God uses the circumstances of life. Now, that does not deny the fact that it seems, based on the Bible, and uh, Ellen White confirms that thing, that even the pagans have some sort of law, unwritten law, unwritten on something hard copy, in their hearts, in their minds. And the Holy Spirit speaks to them directly. But from what I can understand from history, from the history of uh, biological, historical Israel, and then from the history of Christianity, God has always used something hard copy to be an instrumental of teaching that law. And of course, the Holy Spirit is the one because you can read the law and it will never get in if the Holy Spirit doesn't do it. But it does not eliminate it. Did God make Moses to kill the guy and then flee to the desert? I cannot say God did push him to do that. What I can say, though, is God took over. Even the mess that Moses created, God took it and turned it around. And he said, okay, this guy messed up big time. He could have had a different way or different course of action for Moses. But he messed up. And how many times do we mess up and God takes us over with all our mess and, <coughs> and then he starts a new stage of life. Isn't that beautiful? Let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you for the ways you work in Abraham's life. As we want to take from his life whatever was a reflection of Jesus Christ's character, the one he was a friend of. And whenever we see uh, human manifestations of sinfulness, Lord, we want to look at Jesus Christ, the higher standard, and follow him. We thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.